Skyline. Glad that you are here. Brad, appreciate the wonderful song leading and all the other men who participated in our worship this morning. <clears throat> really good morning, and we do have a good crowd, and it's great to see each and every one of you. Joyce attended Rolling Fork uh, High School in the South Delta. I attended Anguilla High School. They were schools about five miles apart, and there was a natural rivalry between the two schools. Now, I know there aren't any rivalries up here. Uh, these rivalries only occurred, you know, in the South Delta. But this, despite the fact that Rolling Fork was about three times larger than Anguilla, we usually held our own against them in basketball and baseball. However, when it came to football, that was a different story. Football at Rolling Fork was a religion. Uh, Anguilla quit playing Rolling Fork in football in World War II. Even back in 1948, my, my older brother convinced my mom and dad to allow him to play football on the Rolling Fork team rather than the Anguilla team because Rolling Fork was a lot better than Anguilla. So mom and daddy had to go down to Rolling Fork. They had to rent a house, okay, down in Rolling Fork, establish a residence so my older brother could play football in Rolling Fork rather than Anguilla. And the, the, this fever of Friday night lights there at Rolling Fork for those Rolling Fork colonels was still going strong in the 1960s when Joyce and I started dating. Joyce's brother Willard was one of those powerful players uh, there in Rolling Fork. He and Archie Manning walked off the field one Friday night there in Rolling Fork after uh, the Colonels had defeated Drew. And guess who was following, just, uh, following them, just ragging Archie Manning at Joyce. Joyce was coming off the field just giving Archie Manning heck because Drew couldn't beat Rolling Fork. And, uh, she was bad in her younger days. Uh, I, I'll have to, you know. Rolling Fork was a perennial power in the DBC. If you wanted to play football in Rolling Fork, you better be sure that you wanted to play. Because just okay was not okay in Rolling Fork if you wanted to play ball. Being just okay on that football team could get you maimed, hurt, or killed when the colonels took the field. In reality, you better sit down and count the cost as to whether you want to play football there at Rolling Fork. Player development started early, junior high. Training, weights, discipline, order, uh, practice, all of that was instilled within these guys coming up. Each one was taught to look out for the other personal trips, fun times, really some dating, any distractions not allowed during football season. Only an all-out effort was allowed. Practice was intent. It even included, y'all, a week of nothing but football at Grenada Lake. They, they rented uh, cabins up and down uh, the, the dam the levees there, uh, up and down the hills there around uh, Grenada Lake, all-out effort for six full days. Nothing but football, training, uh, physical training, mental alertness uh, would be taught. It was nothing but, and, and remember, nothing but an all-out, all-in effort. That's the only way. That's the only way. The idea and the goal was that you would commit your whole self to the goal of winning. No excuses, no whining, no phone homes. It was strictly a no pain, no gain mentality. You were all in or you didn't get to call yourself a colonel. Now on game day, players were treated with royalty. White shirts, ties come in the auditorium. During the day, could not talk to anybody. Total concentration on the game. Teachers couldn't even ask them questions. It, it, it was just, it, it was unreal. 
many of the community on Friday afternoon would come to the to the uh, auditorium uh, for the pep rally. Stands were full, ba band was loud. Folks, many times the opponents wouldn't even score, would not score. The camaraderie and devotion of those players to each other became so strong that it still exists today. I saw it back then in the 60s, and I saw it still in Rolling Fort when George and I was there and spent 10 years there recently. Those bonds that was instilled within those individuals at 15, 16, 17, and 18 were still just as strong now at 65, 66, 67, and 68. Y'all seen on TV and I've marveled at the dedication of the fans of the Green Bay Packers. Tailgating in the snow, the ice, no shirts in zero degree weather. You know, the, the G, the R, <laughs> up there on national TV. Stands are packed, blizzard, can't even see the field. No one's complaining about the cold, the hard seats, the price of a hot dog. Everybody's having fun celebrating. No halfway committed fans. They're all in. They're in mind, body, and soul. And this type mentality, you know, is what gives uh, way to the idea of sports itself becoming a god, okay? And football becoming a religion. And over the years, I, I've often thought about why can't we garner this, this excitement? Why can't we, we, we grasp, okay, this idea of, of winning, this idea of being all in, this idea of, 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 of doing everything you can for the cause of Christ, like uh, the Green Bay fans or the Rolling Four Colonels portrayed. I can certainly see how the drive for best and the drive for commitment to a cause could and should be harnessed for us here and for every church of Christ around the world. Surely you believe Christians should have at least that same mentality, right? They, they should have that same love for the cause of Christ that those players had for football. What if we could gather and garner some of that excitement? What if we could, we could right here, right here, make a commitment to be all in we wouldn't have room here to build the building that we needed to build. We couldn't sit everybody if we would gather and garner some of that love for God. Surely, surely we should. Don't you think we should have the same type intensity for Christ as maybe some of us had for sports in our younger days. If we don't now, surely we can develop it. Surely we can, we, we can understand this is what God wants. Just as those coaches in Roman Fork, they didn't put up with any half-hearted effort. Really, God doesn't put up with any half-hearted effort either. You may give that half-hearted effort. That's not what he wants, and sooner or later you will reap the consequences of that half-hearted effort. God wants you all in, just like your coaches did 
in school. Now, I don't know what excites you. I don't know what gets you revved up. I don't know what gets your blood flowing, so to speak. I'm not sure where and on what you spend your time, talent, and treasure. I don't know. It may not be football. But it's something. It's something that, that, that gathers your attention and that, that, uh, that you love and that you are committed and all in on. It's something different from, by, uh, for all of us, no doubt. But it's something. What is it? You fill in the blank. My message to you this morning is that if you are not giving that same level of commitment to our creator God and his son, then you're not giving God your best. It's not happening. You're not all in. God doesn't occupy first place in your life. In effect, in effect, you're giving God your leftovers. Your leftovers. We're either all in or we're not. You either love God or you don't. We have to be totally committed to the cause of Christ. Now, that's not to say you can't do some other things, obviously. We've got to. But, you know, God has to have your mind, your soul, your heart. He has to have that first place. For us to have the drive here as a congregation, for you to have the drive as an individual for for, for you to lead your family properly it's, as you should, you've got to put God first and have that drive to be committed to the cause of Christ. I've always chuckled at the way Hosea, prophet of God to the northern kingdom there in Israel, this is Hosea 7, 8, and it, <clears throat> is our Bible reading, uh, Cooper had uh, e Ephraim. Oh, that's uh, Hosea seven eight. Ephraim has mixed himself among the peoples. Ephraim is a uh, cake unturned. Aliens have devoured his strength, but he does not know it. Ephraim is a cake unturned. Uh, uh, other translations that use the term half baked. Okay, not done, raw. Every time I read this, I have to chuckle again, thinking of Joyce, because when I fix her pancakes, I have to, I have to flip those pancakes and I have to pat them down, you know, like that. Okay, then I have to flip it again. I have to pat it down again, you know. She wants it done, really, really done. When I fix her egg, I have to break the, break the yellow, and flip it over. And I mean pat it down. And then she wants me to hold it down till the chickens quit hollering. Okay. And then that that that, that egg is ready for her. Same way with the with the turkey burger. And this is hard right here. You know, she wants it wants it like a like a burnt offering, okay? But she wants it still juicy. She wants it still juicy. And that's a hard line there to to kind of kind of meet. But I try, you know, I try. That, that, that Bible verse there in Hosea, uh, a cake unturned, wow, wow, half-baked, done on one side, raw on the other side. That's a pretty good, pretty good description there. Uh, Ephraim, or the northern tribe, uh, I Israel there, had forsaken God's laws, all right? They had compromised their beliefs, they had played around with idols, okay? They had intermingled with the heathens and all this stuff they shouldn't be doing. Yet, on the outside,
outside, okay? On the outside, they retained uh, what they uh, felt like was an outward allegiance to God. Thus, it's the reason God called them half-baked or unturned, half and half. Worthless on one side, wanting to show allegiance on another. A cake unturned. That half-baked cake was a picture of ancient Israel. Question here this morning, do we have any Christians here who are half-baked, unturned, half and half, wanting to, to, to put up that facade there and, and, and play like you love God, but deep down inside, nah, you're not going to do anything extra. You're not going to give like you should give. You're not going to going to uh, encourage anybody. You're not going to support anybody. You're not going to uh, do the things that God wants you to do. But on the outside, oh yeah, you can talk a good game. Half baked, unturned. Appearance and sometimes speech. Others might think you love God, but you really don't. And, you know, Ephraim did this and, and really didn't know they were in trouble. <laughs> they felt like they were okay. Some of us today may not realize it either. We may be half-baked and not even know it. The Apostle John in Revelation 3, 15 puts it like this. I, I, I know your deeds. You're neither cold nor hot. I would that you were cold or hot. So because you're lukewarm and neither cold or hot, I'll spew you out of my mouth. All right, the term here is lukewarm. That is <laughs> because you're half-baked. Because you're a cake unturned. Because you're half and half. Because you're not committed. Because you're not all in. I will spew you out of my mouth. In Luke 14, Jesus lays out the terms for being on his team. Luke 14, 28. Luke 14, 28. For which one of you, when he wants to build a tower, does not first sit down and count the cost to see if he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation, not able to finish, all who observe it begin to ridicule him, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. Folks, it's going to cost us to be committed to Christ. It's going to cost us. It's going to cost you. Do you have what it takes? Do you? Do you love God enough to be committed? There are some things that may cause you not to be committed. Luke 14, 33. So therefore, no one of you can be my disciple who does not give up all of his possessions. Where your possessions are loved more than God, how can you be committed? Clear example there in uh, Matthew 19, 16 regarding the rich young ruler. Three, three uh, sites there. Matthew 19, Mark 10, Luke 18. You know, his possessions, he did not want to give up. His possessions ruled him. He felt like, and he did, I'm sure he did, you know, he kept the law, all of the law, as much as he could. As a matter of fact, he thought he had done it so well that he went before Jesus really bragging, and he was looking for, for Jesus to say, good job. 
Good job. I like your kind of follower there. You're doing good. But Jesus said, go sell all your possessions. <laughs> what? What? Yep. Yep. Because that's what's going to take. That's what it's going to take for you to be all in. That's what it's going to take for you to be committed. Possessions are not all that one needs to give. Matthew 10, 37. Some of us have gone through this. Jesus states that one must be willing to give up their own family for him. Why give up family? Because family will stop you from serving God. Family will, will stop you from being committed. Family can come between you and God if your family is not on the same team with you. God calls for us to give up anything and everything. Really, if you think back, guys, and, and, and ladies too, when you're on the girls' teams uh, playing sports, coaches called for us to give up everything too, to be committed, to be all in, to what we were doing. And if we do that in sports and we do that for material things, shouldn't we do it for the things of God? Surely we should. Jesus drives home the point how serious this is in Matthew 18, 8. I want to get over there and read that, that whole point there. Matthew 18, 8. <clears throat> and if your hand or your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. <laughs> cut it off. If your, if your hand or foot causes you not to be all in, if your hand or, or foot causes you to put something before God, something to take you off the, the path of following God that you should be on, Jesus says, cut it off. Throw it away. Better for you to enter life crippled or lame than having two hands and two feet and be cast into the eternal fire. You think God is serious about us being all in? Sure he is. Look there in verse 9. This is really when it gets tough because this is one of a big fear of us, right? And if your eye causes you to stumble, pluck it out. Could, could blindness be any more serious? It's kind of tough. Blindness is, is, you know, one of those things that we certainly would not want to experience. But Jesus says, hey, it's better to be blind. Better for you to enter life with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into the fiery hell. Do you have what it takes to be all in? Romans 12, 1, we've heard that here a lot lately. Present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God. See, to present your bodies, I think, is a term there that, that, that Paul is saying, put your whole self in. Present your bodies to God. Put your whole self in to God. Have we put our whole self in? Or are we just on the fringes? Taking advantage of everybody else, everything else, but really not contributing to the cause of God. Think about that this morning. I don't know that we really commit to God and Jesus as we should. Because you see, sometimes I think we, we, we bring sins into our worship service that need to be confessed. And we leave 
without confessing them. You know, we, we bring questions in and we leave without them being answered. We've got relationships that, that, that need to be mended, but we live without, leave without mending them. We've got problems that need solutions. We've got burdens that need to be lifted. We've got anxieties that need to be calmed. We've got frustrations. We've got depression. We've got boredom. We've got all of these things that Jesus says, come unto me and let me take care of these for you. But we leave without any of them being corrected. We will walk right back out of our assembly carrying those same problems that we brought in for some reason. God desires that we be all in. God wants us to have the likeness of his son shining out to others. And when, when we are all in, the outside world can see Jesus living in us. And when they can, I do believe we can, we can know that we are all in. Are you ready to put your whole self in? There's a lot of, lot of work that needs to be done. And it's going to take us all to do it. And I'll close this morning with Genesis 11. Starting there in verse 1, and as I read this, I'll remember the thought here. We've got to be all in. God wants us to be committed. God wants us to be on the same page. He wants us to be walking in the same direction. Because there's a lot that we want to accomplish this year. There's a lot that we want to do. And we can only do it with God's help and with, with all of us working together. Look in Genesis 11 verse 1. Now the whole earth had one language and one speech. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east and they found a plain in the land of Sinar. And they dwelt there. Then they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and bake, bake them thoroughly. They had brick for stone. They had asphalt for tar for, for mortar. And they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is on the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the earth. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. And the Lord said, Indeed, the people are one, and they all have one language. And this is what they begin to do. Now, nothing that they propose to do will be withheld from them. Why? Because they were united. They were one language. They were one people. They had one speech. The only problem there. They wanted to build and glorify themselves. They wanted to do things without God. They wanted to do things that they shouldn't have been doing. But God basically said, look how strong they are together. Folks, we can be strong as well for God if we want to. For any reason, we can help you this morning. If you need, haven't been put Christ on in baptism, if you haven't been immersed for the forgiveness of your sins, we can assist you this morning. If you've gotten off on the wrong path or if you, you kind of wandered and meandered around and not really committed yourself to God, we can, we can get you back on the right path. Pray to God this morning to help you. For any reason, you need to come forward. Let it be made known now while we stand and sing.